Perhaps there is no better way to compare mid-century modern architecture with early 21st century architecture than by comparing the two Whitney Museums on the island of Manhattan. The first, designed by Marcel Brewer, was a stark vision of the future with poured concrete exposed nakedly at every opportunity. Brewer was schooled at the Bauhaus and had no qualms about placing this mid-1960s hard-edged fortress-like museum in an Upper East Side brownstone residential neighborhood. There is even a sort of concrete moat and a drawbridge designed as if to keep out the anti-artistic Visigoths that might attack some new controversial show. The style became known as brutalism, and its glory is its unapologetic use of concrete. While the exterior above the street line is clad in granite, most of the other surfaces, inside and out, are raw concrete. Walls between galleries, waffle slab ceilings, shafts, and portals. The wood grain of the concrete forms embed the facades with textures, but they are rendered in cold gray. Even the voids left by form ties which dot the surface of the concrete are exposed and carefully ordered. The effect is bold, harsh, and unyielding, which is the part the museum curators do not like. I like buildings this obdurant, but I would not recommend the style for entire residential districts. The second design by Renzo Piano is a softer form of modernism, perhaps his name is his architectural destiny. The building is more capriciously interactive with the surroundings and more human friendly as it deconstructs the museum as a citadel. Deconstructing the building is something Piano pioneered at the Pompidou Center in Paris in 1977, although the term at the time was high tech. Deconstructive buildings expose the parts that make the building work, the structure, the ducts, the mechanical systems, the electrical conduits, and the means of circulation for the people. It tends to break off particular spaces of the building so they are seen as a distinct form in a different material. The downtown Whitney opened in 2015 in what is now the gentrified meatpacking district. The attraction here for developers, besides the cheaper real estate, was the remnants of an industrial New York with warehouses, exposed iron, terracotta facade elements, and the High Line, the elevated railway that once brought train loads of produce, dairy, and animals to the slaughterhouses. This new Whitney reaches out to the elements of its surroundings. The steel-clad curtain wall building hovers over the south entrance and the arriving patrons like a New York doorman holding an umbrella over a taxi. Glazed walled galleries, rare for museums afraid of natural light damaging their artifacts, face the Hudson River on the west. Outdoor steel and wire platforms give museum goers vistas to the north and east neighborhoods. This includes a drone's eye view of the High Line, now an elevated urban walking garden that meanders through the district. As for the art on the inside, I still find that most of it is simply pompous. When art went from being made for public institutions, churches, and people's homes to being made for museums, it got subjective, political, and self-centered. Art creating beauty became bourgeois. And so my reaction to most of this art is, okay, I get it, please resolve your personal problems elsewhere. The cacophony of egocentric artists fighting for a personal idiom with which they can extract cash from the glitterati gets boring after a while. Add to that dynamic, the redefinition of art to remove craft from the process allows the talentless to declare themselves artists and live some bohemian, self-indulgent, and or self-destructive lifestyle. This lifestyle is often funded by a family trust fund or government grants provided you have the correct politics. For the poorer, undiscovered artist, the lifestyle is subsidized running coffee or dessert boutiques and run-down, economically marginal neighborhoods like the meatpacking district used to be. Back to the architecture. 
Both Whitney museums are quality expressions of the architectural movement of this era. Both are modern to the core. Form ever follows function, as Louis Sullivan said in 1896. The functional influences may be different, and the architect's interpretation of the influences may reflect personal preferences, but both are modern architecture. Modern philosophy was about reducing society to logic, eliminating sentiment, revelation, and history. Modern architecture, then, was about reducing the building to the logical imperatives, simplifying the geometry. If the Whitney's are more complicated than the simple point-line plane geometry promulgated by the likes of Mies van der Rohe, it might be because their starting point, their logical objectives, was simply more complicated. Brewer's modernist logic did not allow for the kinds of ambiguous, humane elements that appealed to people. If the design was dark, ponderous, and foreboding, then people would have to adjust. Piano shows that logic can still accommodate the emotional elements that make spaces comfortable for people, such as light, airiness, and complexity. Neither Brewer's nor Piano's Whitney Museums attempt to hide the true frame or skin of the building with some sort of affected historical architectural style from some distant romantic past. Consider the New York Metropolitan Museum of Art, whose dominant East Entry facade, constructed in 1902, was designed by architect Richard Morris Hunt. Like many buildings in the 19th and early 20th centuries, it affected a neoclassical style so that the building, and thus the collection inside, would have instantaneous gravitas. Of the enduring architectural styles, none are inherently better than any other, but each of them must be rendered with a full appreciation of the core philosophies, or the results will be awkward and repulsive. The mission then of good architecture is simple, to eliminate ugliness and create beauty, and to eliminate chaos and create order, even if, depending upon the time and place, the definition of beauty and order might be subjective. In my mind, the world is big enough for different kinds of architectural visions and architectural styles. There's certainly room for a Metropolitan Museum of Art, Guggenheim Museums in both New York and Bilbao, and of course, both Whitney's in Manhattan. I'm Michael Molinelli, and this is Architecture Codex.